Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I wonder if you remember the COVID years. Uh, maybe you don't want to. Queuing for your nth injection, three paces behind the person in front. Can you remember that? Yeah. One of my memories was the um, mild side effects. Uh, most, for most people, it was mild side effects that many ex people experience right after the injection. You had the injection, then you, didn't, you felt groggy, you didn't feel well for, for a few days. But, but we were told that the long-term um, blessings and advantages of the AstraZeneca jab were far, far outweighed the temporary discomfort of the prick and then the, the, the mild symptoms. We were told that, and, and I think that was true. I'm wondering whether we should think of the last four sermons about the church as a COVID jab. We've had four ser three sermons. Today is the last. Maybe, uh, as you've been listening, there has been some conviction, some challenge, some maybe even discomfort uh, at those three sermons, and maybe the one today. But my prayer... Uh, my prayer this week has been that that temporary discomfort will will be uh, far outweighed by the blessing uh, God will bring to us in the long term as a result of these four sermons on the church. Do you remember we began this short series for three reasons? Number one is reform. Uh, the church we as a church, the global evangelical church should be seeking ways all the time to reform and to, to find ourselves more in line with the scriptures. We should never think that Martin Luther's day is finished and the reformers are finished. We should always be saying, how do, does our present beliefs and practice line up with scripture? Uh, in our home group on... Uh, on, on Friday morning, my, the Friday morning home group, which I only occasionally lead, um, I shared with them uh, really the whole of last Sunday morning's sermon. I'm not going to do that again. Um, but in, in summary, it's this. 70 years ago, if you became a Christian in the UK, you had grown up in a culture where there was so much Christian thinking, worldview, and ethics that perhaps... You could get away becoming and growing as a faithful follower of Jesus just by coming to morning worship on a Sunday and maybe one evening during the week. Because really, you'd absorbed Christian thinking from the centuries, uh, the legacy of centuries of Christianity in the West. And I'm talking about the UK. That is no longer the case today. That knowledge of Christianity, of Christian thinking, of worldview, of ethics, has completely evaporated in the modern world, the Western world. So if somebody from the outside is converted today, they need much, 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 much more than coming to church on a Sunday morning. They need you and me, who are older Christians, to take them under their wing and love them and teach them and invite them into our homes and go for coffees with them. Do you know the real danger is if we continue just expecting that they will grow by coming on Sunday morning, they will turn into religious people. Do you know what a religious person is? A religious person is somebody who comes on a Sunday morning, but their life is utterly untransformed Monday to Saturday. Yeah? They live like the world. And there's a danger if we say to the, the young believers, the precious young believers God has promised to us here at Manor Park, just show up on a Sunday morning, maybe come to home group, but we don't want to see you the rest of the week. We don't want to love you and welcome you into our homes. They, they will become religious people. 
whose lives are untransformed by the powerful gospel because we don't love them and welcome them into our, our homes. We need a, a whole reformation on how we disciple in the modern world. See, we need reform. Secondly, the second reason we started this series was unity. We want to ensure that we're all on the same page in our thinking about the church. So can I just say, if you've missed any of these four sermons, um, can I urge you to go to the website and either listen to them, or you can even download the sermon notes and read them in your lunch break. Yeah, do you get a lunch break? You have to read them after breakfast, Tracy. Okay, Tracy doesn't get a lunch break. Oh, she doesn't take it, she gets <laughs> Okay, diversions, diversions. And the third reason we've done the series is because by God's grace, we are passionate about church planting. We want to become smaller so that we go deeper. So today, um, and, and today, God willing, we will see why church planting is uh, a passion uh, of ours here at Manor Park. I'm going to say three things this morning. Old Testament Israel was called to mission. The New Testament church was called to mission. And so thirdly, you and I are called to mission to, to multiplying. God is calling us to the task of multiplying. So let's start right with the Old Testament. Maybe you didn't think that. The, the God of the Old Testament is a God of mission. And we see that almost right away. Genesis chapter 12. Not, God isn't hanging around. Just the 12th chapter of the Bible, Abraham is called... He's the first Jew, the first Israelite, the first Hebrew, the first uh, man called of faith. And in Genesis 12, God tells them that his, his, his mission is to bless the world. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. Who will you be a blessing to? I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Here it comes. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I'm calling you Abraham, and you are going to be the first person uh, of a great nation. And the purpose of that great nation is to bless the whole world. I don't want you to become an inward-looking nation who just enjoys the blessings of God on your own, but I'm calling you so that you might be a nation who blesses the whole wide world. Now, how did that global blessing come about? Primarily through the Lord Jesus and the Messiah who would come out of Israel and be the savior of the world, but also through Israel's personal witness. She is called to be a light to the Gentiles. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And again, who would this light be? Primarily the Messiah. Jesus is the light of the world, isn't he? Um, but also, personally, through the people of Israel who were encouraged to pray like this, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. See what that verse is saying? Lord, would you bless us? This is the Jew was encouraged to pray this. So that we might be a blessing to the world. Not just so that we might be blessed, but so that the blessing would flow through us into the wider world. So when Israel obeyed the Ten Commandments well, just as an example, the surrounding nations would be blessed. Observe them carefully. For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them? The way the Lord God is near us whenever we pray to him. And what other nation is so great as to have a righteous, such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today. As you go about obeying God's words, thinking of the Decalogue there, the Ten Commandments, the whole world will see how, how wise your God is in giving those Ten, ten Commandments. This outward-looking mandate explains why God placed 
the nation of Israel geographically in the middle of the nations. This is what the sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I have set in the center of the nations with countries all around her. Did you know geographically, God positioned Israel, his people, his nation. I quote, Israel stands at the crossroads of Europe, Asia, and Africa. Geographically, it belongs to the Asian continent and is part of the Middle East region. In the west, Israel is bound by the Mediterranean Sea. Lebanon and Syria border it to the north, uh, Jordan to the east, Egypt to the southwest, and the Red Sea to the south. So even the very location of Israel was designed to be a light to the world. Uh, when, when Yvonne and I were church planting up north, we started uh, the meeting in a room in a hospital. And I, I remember <laughs> we invited a visiting preacher, and uh, he, he must have found it really hard to get, to get there. He must have wound through the hospital like this. And he said to us, he said, he said well, why, why have you chosen such a, such a kind of um, convoluted place to, to meet? And he quoted Ezekiel. 5-5 five, five to us. <laughs> he said, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I've set in the center of the nations with countries all around her. You need a much better place to meet where everyone around can easily get to you and see you. He was right. We relocated. So the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, we see this outward looking vision and mandate. When we move to the New Testament, we find it much more pronounced. What does Jesus do? He goes from village to village and town to town preaching the gospel, doesn't he? Not just in Jerusalem, but in all the towns and villages. He sends out the 12 in twos and the 72 uh, as well. And before he ascended into heaven, he said to his followers, "You, we read this earlier, um, you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I'm giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit, not only for private blessing and comfort and power, but to empower you to witness to the wider world. You'll receive power, and you'll be my witnesses. So when the day of Pentecost came, and that is the birthday of the church, did you know that? Maybe you've asked, when did the church begin? The church began on the day of Pentecost. People from all around the world heard the gospel. They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking to us Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Vis visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, um, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. The supernatural gift of speaking in tongues was given to enable all nations of the world to hear the good news on the day of Pentecost. And God had deliberately chosen the day of Pentecost for the birthday of the church because that's a day in which all these people from all the, all, all the world came to Jerusalem to hear the gospel. And then they could take the gospel back with them wherever they went. The church in Jerusalem grew from 3,000 to 5,000 on the day of Pentecost 3,000 people were converted. And the reason we have these two big numbers, the big number 3,000 and the big number 5,000 in 4-4, is not as an example to us, but to show us the supernatural origin of the church. 
Uh, have you heard it said that on the day of Pentecost, one sermon produced 3,000 converts, but today, but today, 3,000 sermons produce only one convert? That's not fair on preachers, but you know what they're saying, and, and you know the reason 3,000 were converted in, through one sermon was to show the supernatural origin of the church. Did you know the church is a divine institution? It's not like the National Trust or Park Run or the Women's Institute or the Girl Brigades or the Girl Guides or Boys, boy brigade, boys, boys Brigade. It's not, none of those. There's all human institutions. The church is a divine institution. It's a really special. Church is a very special thing. And to, be a, to, be, to belong to the church is a wonderful privilege that we have. Uh, and, and we get that privilege when we believe, Je in believe in Jesus. Then we become part of the church. And 3,000 were converted on the first day. Then it soon grew to 5,000. And I'm going to say something probably you've never heard before. But the enormous numbers of the Jerusalem megachurch became a serious hindrance to the spreading of the gospel. Because Jesus had told his followers, go out and make disciples of all nations. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But they were stuck in Jerusalem. And they were just growing and growing and growing. The Jerusalem megachurch, and I'm going to stick my neck out here and say, like every megachurch since, became a stumbling block to the spread of the gospel because it kept people all in one place rather than scattering them to where they lived and belonged. You know, when human beings to get together, they do Tower of Babel stuff. Human beings gather together for power and prestige. But when God does things, he scatters because he wants to influence the whole world. And the Christians in Jerusalem are becoming too comfortable in their holy huddle megachurch where all the believers together and had everything in common, wonderful, 244, and there were no needy persons among them, 434. So what does God do to the only megachurch in the Bible? He allows it to explode into a thousand smithereens. Stephen, the very first Christian martyr, was stoned to death, and then Omei read this verse. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Sounds terrible news. No, it's good news. It's exactly what God had been telling them to do. What were they doing hanging out together in Jerusalem when they had had the command, go. And so God, who initiated that supernatural 3,000, then 5,000 church, blew it to pieces in his providence. And never again in the New Testament is there any such thing as a mega church. From then onwards, every single church in the New Testament is small. Why? Because you don't want people all coming together from miles and miles around. You want people to go out into all the world and wherever they live to share the gospel. Every single church in the New Testament met in homes. And how many people could live, could uh, meet in a Roman villa? Uh, no more than 100. I've heard that figure bandied around. Even the biggest Roman villa <laughs> couldn't seat more than about 100. So from Acts 8 onwards, the gospel spreads through the missionary journeys of the apostle Paul and his colleagues. And what do they do? They plant one little church after another all over the world. Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, Antioch, Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, Berea, Athens, Ephesus. Lots and lots of little churches. 
and they're all connected together by love and truth. They have no archbishops or bishops or denominations over them, but they have one invisible head, who is Jesus Christ, who loves them, and through his word, and his, their local elders directs them. Brothers and sisters, what Old Testament Israel did, what they were called to do was to be lights to the world. What the New Testament church is called to do, to share the gospel, not to stay all together, but to share the gospel, is our calling today. How can we fulfill that calling to share the gospel with the world? Well, we do lots of, lots of things. Uh, we support missionaries. We engage in outreach events from explorers, seniors, and more. Uh, that lovely thing uh, Eloise mentioned this morning, that light evening, quiz evenings, holiday Bible club, um, Dines Fest. Uh, lots of ways we have to reach out with the gospel. I'm going to say to you this morning, the most effective way to reach out with the gospel for any church is to plant another church. Did you know that? Before Timothy Keller passed away last year, uh, I've got it in my notes, he did the number crunching. I, d I doubt if he did it, but I got his, his friends or colleagues did it. And they found out only what the book of Acts teaches, that the most effective way to reach the world with the gospel a new area, a new village, a new town, a new city, is to plant a church there. How did America become Christianized? Now, I know, there, I know you're going to say there's a lot of problems with that statement, because so often Christianity is kind of associated with the right, is that right, the ultra-rights? I'm not going to go there this morning. I'm not going to go to Trump or anywhere there this morning. You'd be glad to hear. I know there's so many problems with describing America as Christian, but there is no doubt that Christianity grew and flourished in times past in the USA. On the eve of the American Revolution, there were only 17% of the population belonged to a church in America. By the um, Civil War, that was 37%. And in 1980, 62% of America, Americans belonged, they took part, participated in a local church. How did that happen? Not by Billy Graham crusades. No. According to Roger Fink and Rodney Stark, it happened by planting one church after another, after another, after another, after another, up and down the country. And I know someone's here thinking, but I thought America... Uh, began on a kind of Puritan basis, lots of Christians coming over on the Mayflower. Well, this is what they say. There, were, there, there, were, there never were all that many Puritans, even in New England, and non-Puritan behavior abounded. That's what those writers say. No, no, what Christianized America was church planting in every town, in every city, in every state. I, I'm not surprised what Timothy Keller says. I'm not surprised what, what are the names? Fink, Fink and Stark. Because that's what the New Testament teaches. The book of Acts teaches that the way the church grows is you plant more churches and then you plant more and then you plant more churches. So brothers and sisters, we are committed by God's grace to church planting. We want you all to know that. If you're new to us and wanting to join us, we want you to know that. In 2012, by God's grace, uh, Manor Park Church uh, was used by the Lord in, in weakness to plant CCW. And it became independent in 2019. It took seven years for the, the daughter to grow up and leave home, eh? And today it flourishes under the leadership of Randy Mullins. Last Sunday they enjoyed a baptism. They used our pool. Thank you, Matt and Christian. I think you were both there last Sunday helping to set up. And then COVID came along and all church planting at Manor Park. Uh, well, we had to put all our plans on ice. <laughs> had to put everything on ice, didn't we, during COVID. 
Although our home group remembered, was it this week, Julie? I can't remember. So we were reminiscing about some of the nice things about COVID because we used to meet round a fire pit in our back garden. And we've got photographs there with us sitting around a fire pit and we've got our coats on and we've got our blankets on, but we wanted to meet. And, um, but all church planting kind of went during COVID. Um, we had to put it on ice. We, we were continuing to pray, uh, but now that we've well come out of COVID, let me end this sermon and this whole series by answering five questions. Number one, why don't we just grow bigger? Because planting in new areas is the New Testament pattern for the church to really grow. Because small churches enable spiritual gifts to emerge. In a big church, it's very easy for anyone to say, I'm not needed here. Because there's another musician, and there's another preacher, and there's another leader. I'm not needed. And to sit on the sidelines in a small church, everyone has to roll up their sleeves and use their spiritually God-given gifts. You see? You don't have to do that in a big church. You can just rock up on a Sunday and go, and really, you're not engaged. Why not grow bigger? Why not stay small? Because all churches, real and serious discipleship is far more likely to happen than in big churches. Because small churches can foster the I know everyone family, brothers and sisters feel, rather than coming to a big group of people who are just strangers. Why Mulvern? Have I got that right, Chris? Mulvern. So should I spell it M-U-L? Well, that, is that about right? I just can't get it. M-A-U-L. Tim, Tim, you live there. How do you pronounce Mulvern? Mulvern, Mulvern, Mulvern. That's a distraction as well. Seven years of errors. Um, why this place beginning with M? It's a town of 30,000 souls. <laughs> it needs to hear the gospel. That's my American background. Um, it needs to hear the gospel, and we have families who live there. What are the plans? For the last six months, we have been meeting on a Sunday afternoon in the gospel phase of the work with uh, a short, more evangelistic uh, kind of meeting. Uh, we have five amazing blessings, uh, a, a, a wonderful team of people show up every Sunday afternoon. I can't, their unity, their zeal, they, they get home, they, they, they have about 10 minutes to eat and then they come out again. Um, it's a fantastic team. That's blessing number one. Blessing number two, we've seen ones and twos coming along. We haven't seen great numbers. Number three, we are becoming known in the area. We are becoming known. Number, number of signs of that. Number four, a home group has been established. That's wonderful. And in a couple of weeks, number five, a fortnightly coffee afternoon begins. But we feel the time has come to move the church to the church phase where we will probably be meeting on Sunday mornings, which means that some who now meet every Sunday morning here, you won't see. I was to say, you won't see again. That's a bit, that's a bit terminal. Uh, but we'll be gathering, God willing, there. What can you do? First of all, pray. Will you pray for wisdom? Pray for us every week. Pray as we begin to prayerfully expand the team. If you would like to pray this prayer too, ask God if he would like you to serve there instead of here. Maybe someone here this morning, and you might give uh, one year of your time. So you give 2025 to serving at Melvin, and you won't be here, and all your gifts will be used. You will be scaffolding 
and the scaffolding comes down when the building is complete. We're planning to share all the youth work, everything else, so that it will look much like Manor Park does. You're not going to lose out by going. Perhaps the Lord has blessed you with money. <laughs> We're going to need additional part-time or full-time gospel workers. So we are going to need new financial resources. But the, God, but the Lord has always provided. But I throw that one up. Out. Will it be costly? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It will be costly. In your time, in your money, in saying, if not goodbye, au revoir, to folks you've grown to love over many years. But it'll be worth the cost because people who have never heard the gospel will have the opportunity to hear. Isn't that wonderful? That, that's what we're about. We're not about a holy huddle meeting in Malvern. Malvern? Malvern. I'm not going there. M. We're about a holy huddle meeting to share the gospel with a needy city, needy town. Oh, it's worth it. It's worth the cost because of who will be in heaven, God willing, as a result of these labors. It's worth it because Jesus promises his reward to everyone who counts the cost. Peter spoke up. He always speaks up, doesn't he, for the rest. We've left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or feels for me in the gospel, and we're not asking anyone to do this, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, to receive eternal life. Oh, it's worth it. Oh, will it be cost? Oh, yes, it will be costly, but it will be worth it. And it's something very Jesus-like to do, isn't it? Counting the cost and being sacrificial is something very much like Jesus. How can you be most like Jesus? It cost him, the Son of God, everything. He left the land of glory. He left being worshipped by angels, sapphire thrones. And he came into this dirty old world, took on the form of a human being, was despised and rejected by men, was crucified, was stricken by God and afflicted. But out of his suffering, you and I were forgiven. Made right with him, God, and given the hope of everlasting life. Oh, it's going to cost a lot, Roy. It's going to cost a lot. Yeah, it is. But there's nothing you can do more like to, in a more Christ-like fashion than to make sacrifices for the, sake of your, for the sake of the gospel. I'm just going to pray that these four sermons will be useful in our hearts. Shall we do that? Our loving Father in heaven, we have heard four challenging sermons and Lord, whatever is of you, we pray that we would take away this morning. And whatever is not of you, let it disappear like the mist. And Lord, our prayer is that these, uh, these sermons will be useful, if not today, next week, and next month, and next year, in your glorious kingdom to build the church here in Worcester and, belong, and beyond. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.